let me begin by uh, letting you know uh, the, the entirety of the legal team. There have been various lawyers involved in Mondo and Ed's case, beginning you know, with the trial back in, in 1971. In fact, there's only one lawyer, David Herzog, uh, alive today from, from that trial. But as far as the last 10 to 12 years, the, 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 the legal team, I do want to acknowledge some that, that aren't here, uh, that have been part and parcel of the state post-conviction and the federal habeas uh, matters that uh, the attorneys have worked on over the years. And, and, and you should know, uh, by and large, these are, these are volunteer counsel. Uh, besides uh, Tim Ashford and, and myself, uh, again, I'm, I'm Bob Bartle, um, with us today is Beth Hamilton, who's been part of our team for six or seven years now. It hasn't been Beth. Uh, I know she was certainly with me, and she helped chair the, the most recent trial here in Omaha in 2007, uh, proceeding before Judge Bowie on, on Ed's post-conviction. Uh, joining Beth at that council table with me back in, in, in 2007 is a Deputy uh, Assistant uh, Federal Public Defender, John Vanderslice, who took a leave of absence from his work in, got permission from the federal court to join uh, a retired uh, professor at the law college. John Snowden has been part of the team. And then I ought to recognize also Amy Miller, who is the legal director for ACU, ACLU Nebraska, who has been part of the team. So those people continue to work and, and volunteer their time today. Mr. Ashford and I thought it'd be, it'd be a good idea to, to, to just set the context to understand what we're talking about on what happened uh, throughout the legal proceedings here. So let me just briefly take you through. I know some of you, like Nan Graff, have heard this many times before, but it's good for us to, I think, understand uh, what has happened in the past if we can understand what options we have going forward. So you all recall we've talked about the, the, uh, the death of Menard, uh, Officer Larry Menard, uh, occurring here in August of 1970 here in Omaha. And that led to the spring 71 trial, joint trial, over objection of counsel, the joint trial of uh, uh, Mondo, uh, at the time David Rice and Ed Poindexter, in the spring of 71. Uh, uh, Mondo was represented, and that's the one attorney alive dating that team by, by uh, his, his family retained David Herzog, who still uh, practices here in Omaha and was a witness for us in some of the post-conviction proceedings. And then um, Ed was represented by the Douglas County Public Defender's Office, uh, that team uh, was led by now deceased former Governor Frank Morrison. Uh, Tom Kenny did most of the work, uh, also deceased today. Uh, from that conviction followed, following a five-day jury deliberation, uh, where they were tried in a process that we do not use today. They were tried, again, over objection of their counsel jointly, and the same jury heard both the question of guilt and innocence concurrent with the question of whether or not they should be executed, whether, whether or not they should uh, uh, be, be, at the time, put to death by electricity, which led to uh, many conflicts internally throughout that process that the lawyers had. Uh, probably the most poignant example is, in the case of Ed Poindexter, the closing argument was divided between his counsel, Tom Kenny, who told the jury uh, essentially that there wasn't enough to convict his client uh, altogether and his client was an innocent man followed by the closing argument to the same jury at the same time from Frank Morrison who pled for the life of, of Ed Poindexter and, and gave a very eloquent defense against imposing the death penalty. So you have that incongruity uh, as far as the message sent to the jury. Uh, you couldn't have a trial like that today. So that was again setting the context of, of the initial trial of, uh, of Mondo and Ed. That was followed by an appeal to the Nebraska Supreme Court and their convictions were affirmed by the Nebraska Supreme Court in a de decision that came down in 1972. That was followed by both of them going into the federal courts under the habeas corpus process, which is a mechanism by which you ask the federal judiciary to find that there were violations of constitutional rights that were Im impacted. The primary issue that some of you have heard about that the federal court heard <coughs> with regard to this conviction was, was there was an illegal search, a search violative of the Fourth Amendment of the residence of David Rice at the time, a residence no, no longer in existence, that, that home is burned down, uh, without a warrant. Uh, 
Mondo got relief from uh, then uh, District Judge Urban, and, and, and he was, uh, the search was found to violate his rights because he was the owner of the house. And a, a new trial was ordered for Mondo. Uh, the, the government obviously appealed, and that was affirmed by the Eighth Circuit. My client and Poindexter did not get that relief because it was not his house. The, 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 the legal niceties of the situation were that you could not challenge the search of your home as illegal if you were not a resident of home. So he was not allowed into the trial, and he appealed it up, and the Eighth Circuit said no to him. But they, they affirmed Judge Urban's holding with respect to Mondo. That led eventually to Mondo's case being consolidated with two or three cases at the time. And in, in, in a kind of change of the law process, the U.S. Supreme Court in 1976 said in the case of Stone versus Powell, consolidated with Mondo's case that, well, yeah, your Fourth Amendment rights may have been violated, but we're not going to give you a new trial. Rather, your, your remedy would be to sue the police officers for damages. And, and essentially, that, that threw out the new trial that Mondo had. Uh, following that, my client, uh, Mr. Poindexter, actually, uh, to understand the context, had transferred under programs available to him at the time in the late 70s to Minnesota. And it, it was part of the Minnesota state prison system for the next 20 years as a, as a sort of a transfer prisoner. Those programs don't exist today. Uh, Ed, or, uh, Mondo pursued his relief in, in a state post-conviction action. You can go back to the state court saying that there was, there was some constitutional rights violated, there's some new evidence that you ought to take into consideration at the state level to grant a new trial. Uh, that was unsuccessful, but in the course of that, and this is important to understand, the, in the 80s, in that post-conviction procedure brought by Tim Ashford's client today, uh, Mondo Malonga, David Rice, uh, it was discovered, uh, one, that there was a lot of COINTELPRO activity by the force of discovery that, that was going on. You've heard all about that. The original attorneys were not aware of, of the role the FBI and COINTELPRO was playing in the process, and that led to a memoranda and discovery of evidence that, that suggested that COINTELPRO was focusing in and was simply trying to help manufacture a case against these two people. The most significant example of which was the FBI was very aware that this 9-11 tape of the phone call existed and could be analyzed at the time, but they actually, although initially volunteering to analyze the tape, wanted that request withdrawn when, when police chief Gates at the time said, don't, don't proceed with that analysis. Uh, those sort of documents came to light in the 80s. Uh, that led, again, not enough evidence to get Mondo a new trial, another uh, uh, appeal of that to the Supreme Court, and then a journey through the federal court system as far as uh, uh, David Rice. In the case of Ed, he's a kind of out of state, out of mind with that process. He contacts me around 2000 saying, now, do I have options available to me? Because his focus really at the time had been much more on the notion that, that uh, you know, he, he had understood that, number one, he didn't have legal options except for some type of either a pardon or a parole process, and number two, that, that there were uh, remedies available to him uh, along those lines. We then brought a state post-conviction action on his behalf in 2004 that led to a 2007 hearing. And by this time, what we presented to Judge Bowie here in, in Omaha was not only additional FBI memoranda, but the tape uh, that was played in Mondo's and an expert, a uh, nationally renowned expert who, who did uh, voice analysis for, such, for both the uh, government and defense attorneys. And, and it had been retained, for, for example, by the government to authenticate uh, terrorist uh, recordings of, uh, of like Bin Laden. Uh, and so a, a nationally recognized expert who, who analyzed the tape, and we were able to run down Dwayne Peak, uh, going by the name of Gabriel Peak, and got a district court order here in Omaha to have his voice analyzed. We couldn't get his deposition as such, but we could get his voice. And that really led us to run him down, get him subpoenaed in to give a voice <coughs> exemplar. And our expert told the court in 2007 that that tape that we knew was the 9-11 tape, again, from, from the proceedings in Rice's case, the actual authentic recording was not the voice 
of Duane Peak. Well, now that information would be highly probative or highly significant if the attorneys had that information at the time. And we uh, established that quite clearly. The court said that's not enough. Uh, that then was appealed to the Nebraska Supreme Court, who turned it down in 2009. After which, working with Mr. Ashford, we both brought additional proceedings back into federal court. But because we'd been there before, essentially, you have to go to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals first and get permission for a second uh, federal proceeding, and they turned both of us down. So that gives you sort of a nutshell of where we have come from, and uh, I'll let Tim talk about a little bit on where we are going from here, because uh, I've said enough. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Timothy L. Ashford. I'm in Omaha. I'm a criminal defense attorney. I do personal injury. And at 53, I've been on this case for about 10 years, and I'm the youngest attorney on the case. So what happens is sometimes they look to me for the new energy which I have to provide, okay? Um, and I don't look at it through their eyes either because I'm, everything they've tried before, I want to try again because sometimes when you watch a football game, they'll run one play, it won't work, then they'll run the exact same play, and it will work. Also, the person who joins me on this, my side, uh, is Lennox Himes. He's an attorney out of um, New York. Lennox has been on the case for about 20 years. And basically, I consider Lennox Hines to be the Johnny Cochran of political prisoners. Uh, he's done a lot of cases. He rep represented Nelson Mandela. He, uh, he knows Fidel Castro. He hangs out with the, when I go anywhere to any seminar, I mention his name and everybody knows him. So that's how uh, important and powerful he is. And as quiet as it's kept, he's a, a, the Johnny Cochran of political prisoner cases. Um, as uh, Bob said earlier, last year we both filed a brief in federal court. Um, they announced the paper that Poindexter had filed his brief. There was no mention in the daily paper, the news stations, or anywhere else of the mention that Mondo had filed a brief. And this is the reason why. They said that Mondo had exhausted all of his appeals. The paper continually reported that if you do some research, any one of you, and you come across any one of those articles, send me a copy, okay? <laughs> but they have basically said over and over, he exhausted all of his appeals. So how was I able to walk into court and get him an appeal? And you remember we waltzed into court with you about the same time? Well, what happened was uh, there's a little quirk in the law where if you're a co-defendant, I'm kind of tied with the co-defendant, and if his rights, if he has a one-year statute in which to file his appeal, well, you know what? I have a one-year statute in which to file my appeal. And when I filed my appeal, although they denied both appeals, nobody even questioned the fact that we had filed an appeal, and the Attorney General for the state of Nebraska didn't object to me walking into court and filing an appeal. So, because of the fact that both of them were dismissed last year, I felt that, especially in Mondo's case, uh, there was a little bit of publicity, and I don't feel that the publicity that they've been getting on this case has been, number one, fair, and number two, enough publicity. So this year, what I did on my own, on my own initiative, and I wanted to say something uh, before I went on, just this just came to mind. Uh, when we had Mr. Peek up here earlier, and he's a Black Panther, I lived at 2110 Ohio with this, when this bombing, around the time this bombing occurred. And every black kid in my neighborhood, young man, when we grew up, we wanted to be a Panther. Because they were very powerful, and they protected the community. What people don't realize is growing up in North Omaha, I was a little bit younger than Vivian Strong, who got shot, and I think you remember that in 1969. That summer, I couldn't play outside. I couldn't go outside and play because my parents feared we would get shot. So we had to stay the whole summer on the porch. Our heroes were the Panthers because they protected us from the police. And although uh, other people had different histories and memories, when I was a kid, people in my neighborhood disappeared. Black people, I, we were arrested, 
you have to remember the context of the time. You had a lot of black Vietnam veterans coming back who knew how to use arms and had been trained in military warfare. You had until 1966, what most people don't re realize is Miranda v. Arizona was decided in 1966. That gives you the right at that point to basically, you have the right to remain silent, the right, anything will be used against you. It wasn't enforced in the ghettos until 70 or 71. That meant my neighborhood. So what happened was you had kind of a, a, a light and gas. What you had were a lot of Vietnam vets who insisted on their rights, a lot of uh, young blacks who weren't going to take the kind of police brutality. And I learned through uh, the last couple months that the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense is the full name of the Black Panther Party, not just the Black Panther. So what happened was, you'd have people in neighborhoods disappearing, and the police wouldn't read them their rights. Then what you would have is a group of young men who were saying, wait a minute, this is outrageous. Then it was inevitable that they had to form, and they did form, and they called themselves the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. What you had at that point is, J. Edgar Hoover realized that when Bobby Seals and Huey Newton started in 1966, there were two of them in Oakland, by 1969, there were 10,000 armed people running around the country who insisted on their rights and insisted that police brutality was not going to continue in their neighborhood. So that's where you came into Operation COINTELPRO, that secret organization to start eliminating African Americans and to knock off the heads of Black Panthers. What happened was you had uh, Geronimo, well, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark who were the Panthers in Chicago, they were killed as part of a police raid. And what my understanding was, the, uh, some informants had put some um, sedatives in their Kool-Aid the night before, and that's why they couldn't wake up. So they were basically massacred. They said there were 99 shots fired by the police at that 4 a.m. Raid, raid, and there was maybe one shot returned by the Panthers. So um, that's also you had, at that point, um, what you had was uh, Geronimo Pratt, 1970. He was represented by Johnny Cochran, the late Johnny Cochran. Johnny Cochran insisted that they can't convict you because the FBI had you under surveillance in another city at the time this murder of Carolyn Olson occurred. That's not what happened. They convicted him anyway. He spent the next, I believe, 27 years in jail until he was freed and he lived in, I mean, he lived in Africa. He was freed, I think, in 27 and he recently died. Now, there was some reference a little bit earlier to um, basically what happened in that preliminary hearing of Mondo and Poindexter. And the reference was, I've heard a number of people say that. Well, to make a long story short, since last year I didn't get any publicity when I filed the Mondo brief, this year I've done a series of articles in the Omaha Star. So now I have to stop and do a quick commercial here. If you do anything here, get a subscription to the Omaha Star. Because they allowed me to write as much as I wanted to, except they said the only limitation is each week you have to be limited to 750 to 800 words. I can live with that. Now, <laughs> since I have you here, I'm going to read you exactly what you all said Peek said. I went over to the court, and as an attorney, I checked out the transcripts. And I watched, there was an excellent British broadcasting documentary done on three people, Mondo, Pratt, and Poindexter in 1991. And they came over here, and basically they said as well as they could, they're political prisoners. But with that, I'm a, this is the article which appeared September 9, 2011. It's entitled Ed Poindexter, and I'll be brief. And we longer in prison 40 years, part seven. So I've done 10 parts now. So what you should do is, if you can, catch up with the old issues. But please get a subscription, because they allowed me the freedom to do this. The first paragraph, an audible and loud gas was made by spectators in court after the young man slowly removed his dark glasses, revealing a black eye and other bruises as he sat in the witness stand in the most bizarre preliminary hearing ever held in the state of Nebraska. 
The, now here's the prosecutor, Dwayne Pete. I'm going to call your attention August 10th, 1970. Monday of this year and ask if you saw the defendant Edward Poindexter, Poindexter on that day. In the official transcript, he says no. The prosecutor says you did not. He point, I mean, um, Pete says no. When did you first see defendant Poindexter? Pete says, pertaining to what? You are going to have to speak up. I can't hear you is what the prosecutor O'Leary says, Arthur O'Leary. O'Leary. Then he says, pertaining to what? Question by O'Leary. Pertaining to the Menard case. He's getting a little frustrated. Uh, I don't think I remember seeing him, said Pete. Question. I will call your attention to Monday, August 10th, 1970, and ask if you were at the address at 2816 Parker Street, Mondo, which is Mondo's address, on Monday evening. Pete says, no. O'Leary says, you were not there? You were not? He, his answer, no. Were you on Tuesday? Pete says, no. I call your attention to Friday evening, August 14th, and asked if you were at the American Legion on that particular evening. I think I was. I don't know for sure is what Pete says. On that particular occasion, did you see the defendant Poindexter? No. And the prosecutor says, you are Dwayne Peake. Yes. And in the British broadcast, and I'll be brief here, when he Pete testified in the morning, he denied any involvement on my part, or Ed Poindexter said Mondo in the BBC uh, documentary. Mondo said it in that documentary, and some of you have seen it. My reaction was a little dude is stronger than I could have guessed because I know they have done some things to him or said some things to him that would scare the hell out of him, but somehow he's not going along with the program. Then, when court started at 1.30, and I got this from the official transcript, uh, Prosecutor O'Leary stated that this morning, the testimony of witness Pete had taken us by surprise. How can the testimony of your witness take you by surprise? This is your witness now. So, I wrote, in the afternoon, Pete changed his appearance and his testimony. And Herzog, the attorney, and I'll be brief and, and wrap this up. Pete comes in wearing, this is his exact statement. Pete comes in wearing sunglasses and looking visibly shaken and changed, so I asked Pete to take off his sunglasses. That's what Herzog said. When he took off the glasses, when he took the glasses off, the people in the courtroom let out an audible gasp, said former state senator Ernie Chambers. And this is how Chambers described him. His face around the eyes was swollen. It looked discolored to me. His eyes were red. It was clear he had been crying, said Chambers. My, and he said that in the BBC documentary. My impression at the time was he had been struck physically, and that is what caused the discoloration and the marks around his eyes. And Herzog said Dwayne Christopher Peake had been really worked on between the morning session and the afternoon session. So when we talk about um, what was said, what happened, is there's actual evidence within the transcript. Now, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up here shortly, um, but what I wanted to say, as part of the articles that I'm writing, and I have a few copies here, I didn't bring very many of the, of the first three, uh, but as part of the articles I'm writing, um, I direct people to the Mondo Lango at Facebook, and then there we have a Mondo Lango at Gmail. Mondo's been receiving, and I, I operated it, I put it up, because at the next time I file any type of brief or any type of legal action, I want people to know about that. Now, our, what, our course of action this year is we're going to be looking at the petition for rid of habeas corpus, probably in state court. I don't want to give away too much of what we're going to do, because it's in the uh, formulation stages right now. A petition for rid of habeas corpus is simply let the body go and basically what we're saying is he's been in jail for too long. Now we have an issue that we may try to revisit with the Board of Pardons. Now and I'll be brief and this will be in an upcoming article. Imagine if you walked into court and you were the only one in court and what occurred was the prosecutor said basically, oh, you're here for your traffic ticket, speeding. Then the prosecutor said, oh, just wait a minute. Um, and no one else is in the courtroom. He, the prosecutor then walks around to the bench and says, oh, by the way, I happen to be the judge. How would you feel about that? 
trying to get your, a fair case or a fair shot. Well, the Board of Pardons in our state, and in some states they've gotten away from it, must first commute the sentence to a term of years in order for Mondo and Poindexter to be eligible. The Board of Pardons is comprised of three people, the governor, the secretary of state, and that attorney general who gave you that ticket, okay? So, with that being said, that may be one of the issues that we raise when we file our petition. The unfairness of the fact that the parole board, which had granted Mondo parole, I believe, in 1991, 5-0 vote, I believe that was what it was, just off the top of my head. They were stopped by the Board of Pardons, uh, basically saying, which is comprised of the Attorney General, who when I file and Poindexter files any petition in court, they oppose it. So it's not fair for you to sit on that board where you got to make a decision on whether or not the sentence is commuted. So with that being said, I'll turn it back over to Bob. I, I think you've heard enough. Of let's, let's give you a chance now to, to ask questions of us as far as uh, the, the legal process. What, what, um, plan, what do you have to do to do so, but what is the strategy uh, if that doesn't work? Well, one of the other things that we're looking at beyond, because the court has, the federal court has told us that they, they no longer have the habeas corpus remedy available. <clears throat> That's uh, what Tim had alluded to as far as a remedy by, by which you say the government must provide you a new trial or freedom. There are other things implicated when you have things that took place, such as the COINTELPRO program. You saw about that earlier. So what Beth and I and Tim are also looking at are your, your remedies under federal civil rights law. Uh, it's the federal civil rights law that, that allows, uh, for example, an employee to sue an employer who would discriminate against her on the basis of her gender or race or something like that. Well, obviously, we, we have all kinds of information that people like Mondo, people like Ed Poindexter, had their civil rights violated by programs such as COINTELPRO. The, that's one of the remedies we're looking at to get another case underway to gather some additional documents. The limitation, the problem with that is most of, most of the time you have a civil rights case, you're limited to money damages. That doesn't buy freedom, so to speak. But there are some extraordinary cases where federal courts have found the violation so extraordinary <coughs> that they have done things like grant a new trial. So that's another angle we're looking at, how programs such as the COINTELPRO program violated the federal rights, the, the, the constitutional rights, to be free of that type of violation of your civil liberties from government action. Sir? This is um, not really a question, I guess an observation, but it seems like, you know, with all the holes, you know, that's in this case you know, over the years, you know, as many times as you went to court, it's almost like the system is saying, we don't care what you come up with, we don't care what you do, we're going to keep them here. That, 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 that is a frustration. Let, let, me, let me put it another way that, that is, is the practical problem that Tim and I face. Ultimately, we need to convince a federal judge or a, or a majority of state judges that there is something inherently wrong here. Um, we need to convince with the force, for example, that we illustrated that, that people from, uh, that you, you, some of you heard the, the so-called Beatrice Six cases, I, that was another case I was involved in, something with the strength of DNA evidence to simply illustrate, here is the right person that committed the crime, ergo, the same DNA frees uh, these people. We need to have that sort of convincing showing that allows at least one judge to say there's an injustice that's taking place here. And unfortunately, in, in, in Rice and Poindexter's case, it wasn't the blood evidence, it wasn't the bodily fluid evidence, it wasn't something that you could retest. It's, it's something like Dwayne Peake that ultimately uh, still holds tragically to his story, I think more out of fear than anything else as far as the last time we heard from him, 
that, uh, that he was put up to the crime of the killing of, of Menard. And we haven't been able to, to make that strong a showing yet, such as a, a DNA evidence evidentiary showing would be. Yes, ma'am. Has there ever been anyone who, um, I'm, I'm thinking maybe not, but um, I think both of us believe that Dwayne was put up to help frame these guys. Yeah, um, I just read that. Well, yeah, but <laughs> yeah. nevertheless, a police officer was killed, a person was killed, but yeah. there was a police officer. Who, if anyone, um, have tried to find out who that person was that actually planted the, I mean, did any, I mean, has anybody over the years gotten close to that, or is it just still out there as like, you know, Go ahead. They have a lot of theories on who may have done the uh, killing in uh, learning about the case. And I have to say, I'm a lot less frustrated about the case than Bob is. He's worked on the court longer than I have. So, and that's the beauty of having a younger attorney. You're not to that level of 20 years of frustration yet. I'm only 10 years, and I'll keep on it until we get them out, okay? But there was a, um, in my memory, is that, um, as I remember going over some of the evidence, there was a bombing at, um, in Minneapolis which was similar to this, within a week time period of this, this bombing. Also, they said they may have, there were some um, allegations that they may have seen two white guys running away from the house. Uh, and then there was the three people, individuals who they caught with dynamite, who were mysteriously, their case was mysteriously dropped about a week after um, Mondo and Poindexter were convicted, were convicted. and I can't remember their uh, names right off the top of my head. I know, I'll probably know it when I get back to the office, just like, or walk out this room, but I can't remember those three. They were, drunk, they were, um, they were stopped with dynamite in their car, arrested, and then, I think one of them's name was Gray, but, um, well, so. Mark Mitchell my, and uh, Gray, Gray, and, and someone else. Tyrone. Tyrone. I don't know oh, okay, but there was three of them who were arrested with dynamite, and after they, uh, Mondo and Poindexter were convicted, they let them go. With, they didn't have any charges against them, or they had minimal charges. So, uh, also, there was something curious about the dynamite. Um, basically, what occurred was, in the BBC, uh, you heard police officer McClarity say, it was suspicious how they searched the house, how they came up there and got it. What occurred to me as striking as an attorney who's seen this, I grew up. At the time the bombing occurred, I lived right down the street. But what was really striking was the fact that they only had a picture of the dynamite in the trunk of the car. Yeah. Uh, there was no picture of the, if you went in there and you went, gotcha, you would have taken a picture of the dynamite in the trunk of the car. But because there wasn't, that just strikes me as very, very odd. And um, there may have been some allegation that um, somebody, may, they may have been trying to plant the police, trying to plant it in, but they got scared off for some reason and just said, forget it, we'll just take a picture uh, of the dynamite in the trunk of the car. And those are just allegations I've heard over the number of years I've been working on the case and after a review of the evidence. So, But, you, but you're absolutely right. We have pursued a number of, of leads from the Des Moines uh, uh, bombing, the, the tracing of dynamite. Uh, to, but do we know, do, can, can we point to a particular individual? Uh, I suspect my client has his theories. Uh, in fact, we, we've even talked about some, but with, with, with a degree of certainty, no. Well, over the years, I, and I, I just had to ask that question. I mean, sure, I know in my it's a good mind, question. Um, I kind of have, I guess like everybody else, their own feeling, but, um, and I was young at that time, but um, I just, even going way back to being a young teenager then, in my mind, despite the Dwayne Peake story and all that, because that came after, you know, I mean, the fact of the police officer being killed, it just sounded like from what I was hearing, the stories that I was hearing, that if the police had investigated itself, the police, and I guess maybe I feel like this, not because of my situation, which is having a sister who at 14 years old came up missing and um, later on, many, many years later, 
when information was brought to me showing that she was named in an ATF warrant that was served on the Black Panther headquarters, uh, it just made it seem like to me that once again, here's the police involved in something that um, it's just, you know, the whole thing is bigger than the people that are in it, you know what I mean? And of course, they're not going to investigate themselves. Like today, you know. Sure. Yes, sir. Uh, the snitches that were busted with the dynamite, they tried to sell that dynamite to my brother and I. Okay. And we threatened to shoot them on the spot. Mm -hmm. It was in front of my, my mother and father's house. Mm -hmm. and we told them to get the hell out of here and get away from us with that dynamite. Mm -hmm. Because we already knew there were snitches and it was a setup. Mm -hmm. So, there, were, there are a lot of pieces to this case, like uh, they were saying that uh, Dwayne and Ed met at my house and did the planning for this. Well, Dwayne came to my house one day, but Ed was at my house another day, and they were never at the house together. And uh, we, we stated that. But I guess it didn't carry much weight because, you know, I mean, you're not even speaking about that here. I know that what I remember so well about that is that the night Ed Coindexter was there, we were upstairs in my parents' house, and Ed kicked over a can of beer in my parents' bedroom. And all hell broke loose. <laughs> One of those things you can't forget. <laughs> and my dad put Ed out of the house. So I know Dwayne was not there. And they did no planning, you know, at that, at that juncture regarding doing anything. Because they weren't there, there together. Dwayne had come, if I'm not mistaken, it might have been the day before. Because he's my cousin. And he just stopped by and we just kicking it, you know, and then uh, somehow somebody put those two things together and spread that lie about it. Now, I don't, I don't know about this story about the uh, car and the dynamite because I was accused of having a car with dynamite and, and machine guns and all kinds of stuff, you know, out of where those stories came from. Uh, Vicki, I was under the impression that uh, the police forced your sister to say some things and then to keep her from telling the truth. They, get, they sent her out of town and told her she couldn't come back. So I don't know. Well, I mean, you know what, I, 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 would not, I would not doubt that after, um, in 1996, um, being brought uh, uh, I haven't had someone visit me at work that I didn't know, a total stranger, who gave me inside information um, that totally just changed what we had thought, which was that maybe, you know, she was a victim of a homicide, right. either here in Omaha, and being the police wouldn't take a report saying that she was a runaway. Um, you know, she could have left town with somebody else and became a victim of a homicide, but we just kind of got along the homicide lines and just lived with that until 1996 when Christian, uh, Christian Zeichel came to my, um, to my job and told me that she had information that said otherwise, and then shortly following that visit, she um, showed me an ATF warrant where she had been named in it. So that just totally, it totally blew me away. And I, 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 I did not and have not pursued anything because when I looked at the fact that this wasn't a, hom a homicide, there, this is law enforcement. So they, they either had something to do with this or they know something about what happened with my sister. And I mean, I had small children. My youngest child that was seven years old and my first feelings was, I get involved in this and can move somewhere close to the truth. What could happen to me? If something happened to me, what's going to happen to these three children that I have to raise? So I backed off. But now I'm ready to try to find out where my sister is, if that's possible, or what happened to her if she's not still alive. Yes. One thing that's uh, a little puzzling is you said earlier that 
she disappeared in 1972? Um, well, it wasn't really... Mm -hmm. yeah. No, it was 71. 70, 71. 71. When, mm -hmm. when in 71? It was in August. Because in, in August of 1970, there was a, um, a fuss about a warrant which I've always considered to be an FBI warrant. They were going to search the Panther headquarters, and somehow the Justice Department told the FBI to knock it off, not to do it, because apparently something was wrong. I've not seen that FBI warrant. You referred to an ATF warrant. I can't, well, you know what? The, the warrant might not have been issued by the ATF. Maybe they were just, Maybe it was, it was somewhere on that piece of paper. And in, but if that was all right before the <coughs> explosion in, in 1970. That. So uh, that it, if it was 1970, that makes more sense. Well, you know what? I, I don't think it was. It wasn't 70. She didn't. She was around after the. Um, and you know the the girl that. The, the girl that, to my knowledge, was the last person to see her alive that my family knows of was a neighbor that she had <coughs> that Unfortunately, she's deceased as of February of this year. So I can't ask her. Her brother may have recollection of it because he still lives next door. But I know that it wasn't immediately following the raid on the Black Panther Party. I don't think that. <coughs> was no longer seen. I can't, but I don't have that. I don't have that warrant anymore. Um, so Vicki, like, uh, Kitrin is supposed to be sending us that ATF warrant right now. Charge went down to see okay. the car. Okay. And so okay. to we, we had another question in the back. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is uh, there any investigation, and maybe it has nothing to do with it, but why Dwayne went west and how he went? Well, we know we know this much that 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 being a juvenile, uh, being being 15 at the time, he his his deal was being processed through juvenile court. He did a little time in Carney, and then he was released, and he was given a new identity. Uh, he was part of a, a witness protection program. Uh, he worked his way through Colorado. He worked his way through Montana, uh, and again. Uh, as recently as 2006, when we got his voice, he was uh, living as Gabriel Peak. Uh, he was on his uh, third marriage. He, uh, he was in the area in and about Spokane, Washington, and he still wasn't uh, ready to, to change his story. But understand this, Dwayne Peak could be in this room. He could be sitting at this table with Tim Asher and I, and he could tell you all raising his hand uh, and swearing on a Bible that, that, that I was put up to it. You know, I, I, I recant. I changed my testimony. That doesn't mean that we even get a new trial. The state of Georgia just put, put a man to death where seven witnesses changed their story. I saw that earlier. It's a whole different analysis when, when there's this much passion. There are many reasons that the that, that judges hear why witnesses change stories. So that, that does not give them a new trial. It, it might, we, we'd love it for it to happen, but that doesn't lead to their release, if so fact. Two, Sir. Two questions. Um, what does give them a new trial? And secondly, you gentlemen's thoughts and my known thoughts on the ability of the legal system to render justice. <laughs> well, on, on, the, on the second one, I'll let Tim speak for his client. I understand. Understandably, my, my class a little bit jaundiced, but, but let me speak to, to your first question. What gives it, again, ultimately someone who wears a black robe convinced of their innocence, that's even brought, that's brought about by one of two things, clear and convincing, convincing proof such as with the import of DNA that they are not involved, or the solution of the crime by illustrating, like in Beatrice Six, that the real killer of Helen Wilson and Beatrice back in 1983 was in Oklahoma, you know, and, and was already, you know, by, by the force of DNA evidence, you know, the, the early investigation was botched because they had the real killer and they, and they, and they you know, didn't, didn't get it done. So you've got to essentially either solve the crime 
by saying, here's the real person that led to the death of Menard, or established beyond that. And, and, and that sort of flips it on its head, but you have, you know, when it's been, been this long, you have to establish almost beyond doubt that, that your people were innocent. That's, the, that's what faces Mr. Agnes. The, the attitudes of these men, though, are absolutely remarkable. I mean, uh, I get frustrated, you're, you're right, after so many years, and, and Ed is, is, is the eternal, uh, uh, proactive, optimistic person in terms of, of making the best out of what the circumstances of life have dealt him over the last 40 years. He, he re-inspires me every, every time we visit. I'll let, I'll let Tim speak to Mondo. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to represent Mondo. First time I went down to the penitentiary, uh, I walked in and um, the guard, I said, I'm here to see Mondo. The guard was happy to see me. He said he hadn't had an attorney visit for a while. We're glad you're here. Um, and I wrote that, that was in one of the articles I wrote because they are very well respected. We had an issue with the warden about uh, within the last two years. And the warden, from the warden on down, because Mondo and um, Poindexter are an inspiration, I, at least to me, and I know to Bob, because you go down there and you wonder, man, you've been in jail for 40 years and you'd expect them to have a different attitude. But their attitude, it, I mean, it just cheers me up sometimes. And to be quite frank with you, um, I don't have that million dollar case yet. <clears throat> I don't have a lot of people knocking the door down to uh, come to my office for representation. But I tell you, it makes me proud that I, as well as Bob, are representing these two men. Because you have to look at it in the context of history. The people who basically arrested Martin Luther King Jr. weren't aware at that time he was going to have a national holiday. Years later, they said, look, we got bridges, roads, everything else. The people who arrested and uh, followed Malcolm X weren't aware of that. Uh, we recently had a dedication to an individual from Nebraska, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with this story, Standing Bear. They dedicated a statue to Standing Bear. He was a, a Native American who left. They forced him down to Oklahoma. He came back, and uh, basically they arrested him. They filed a petition for rid of habeas corpus, and he was free. Uh, and uh, what happens now, although the people who arrested him at his time weren't aware he was going to have an elementary school named after him or a lake named after him. And I keep telling uh, myself, I don't, I, and I've told my client, I said, you know what, as a part of you being political prisoners, years from now, this society is going to realize what they've done to you and what they've done to freedom in this society. However, my concern is not 100 years from now when you get a lake in an elementary school named after you. Bob's concern and my concern are for here and now. So what we have to do, first of all, I'm always optimistic that there's going to be some legal maneuver that we can do which will uh, ultimately allow these men to be free. However, um, with this gathering, it's a great start. And I told Bob before we started, I said, you know what? This internet thing is not going away, so I might as well learn it. So I made the, <laughs> I made the decision today to start paying more attention to it. I got somebody to help me do a Mondo Lango Facebook and I'd like if those of you who can to join on it, write on it. Um, but I was really inspired, although it didn't, uh, although it didn't save Troy Davis, by those million people who basically uh, were able to sign on to that petition. That's what I heard it was. Now, here's the deal with this. When people are making judicial decisions, the more uh, scrutiny that people have on those judicial decisions, the more chance that they may get it right. And if they get it right, it may be gotten right in our favor. Okay? Uh, so I'm, I'm always hopeful, and, and that's one of the reasons I, I wrote a series of articles. I'm going to do about 15 of them, and I'm going to post them on the, on the Internet. And the reason I'm going to post them is it's a lot easier for people to help you with your cause, especially people outside of the, the Nebraska and the United States. Because before, if I wanted somebody in Japan 
uh, to go ahead and understand what was going on with the case, I'd have to translate into Japanese. My understanding now is they've got computers and technology that can instantly translate whatever you write into something else. So by hopefully posting it on the internet, that will help with the community involvement. However, it's still the buck still stops here. We've got to put down a, we got to put out a great legal product, and we still got to do arguments uh, in order to get them uh, get before a judge and try to do our best. We'll do our best, and we thank you all for coming out because you you're, you're showing us you're going to do your best too by coming out here and supporting these men. And I'm going to basically I took a picture at the beginning when everybody's back was to me, because you know how people are. I don't want my face show, I don't want my face show. But I'm going to share with Mondo the number of people who came out in the support, and I'm sure Bob will too. The gentleman here, young, young man here. Uh, this is a question about the fingerprints. Was that an issue in the case? There really weren't any, any fingerprints. There, there weren't any. <coughs> the, 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 the trouble was, there, the, there is no question that a man died. Man was blown away, and, and, and uh, other, others, others were injured. But there was nothing identifying uh, who brought the suitcase, except one young man, a 15-year-old, said, "I did it. I planted the, 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 you know, I essentially confessed. But these two put me up to it. And and you know, there, so these dynamite particle things. There was a little bit of forensic evidence, but every attorney I've talked to, of course, the case said. The, the only reason they're in prison today is the jury chose to believe, even though he told various stories, the, the story of uh, when he was testifying, the 16-year-old witness by the name of Dwayne Peake. They, they, they had to have that. And, and, and you can't really test the veracity of a witness by, 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 by fingerprints. And uh, Arthur O'Leary made a statement that if they didn't have the testimony of Dwayne Peake, it would have been a slim case or none at all. So his case, his testimony was very instrumental in their conviction. And from what people described, and I heard the, I've heard the tape, his voice, Dwayne Peake's voice at the time, time sounded like more like Pee Wee Herman. If you hear that voice on the tape, it sounds more like Barry White, the singer. So um, there's a big difference. In, there's no way any jury would have heard that <laughs> tape and said, this is the voice of a 16-year-old high-pitched teenage young man. So that's why they had to uh, say, one, we destroyed the evidence, I mean, we destroyed the tape. And remember, the tapes resurfaced because the 911 operator made a copy of it and kept it, and they discovered it when <coughs> the 911 operator died. Wow. So. Mr. Pete, did you have a comment or a question? Uh, I just want to share with everybody here, um, Ed's been through uh, some real emotional uh, issues here. First, his mother died a month ago, oh. and she died of breast cancer. And then, right after that, uh, last week, his, his niece died of breast cancer. So, if you could send them uh, a sympathy letter, anything, a card or something, because we've got to maintain that relationship sure. with them. And they grieve, and they don't have us there to grieve with them. So they need to know we, we know what's going on, we support them, we love them, and we have to carry that on for them. Well, and, and, and uh, thank you, Mr. Peek, and, and let me follow that up by, by, by noting that, uh, that uh, besides the, the, the power of the personalities of, of Mondo and Ed, and besides the lawyers I've referred to, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the woman I, I, I should, you've all met Tariq, but the woman who, who initially got me involved by saying we need an attorney to go up to Stillwater, Minnesota to, to get Ed out of a, a, a race riot situation where his only crime was you know, being, being black between uh, the guards and, 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 and the rioters, uh, is, is my old English teacher, my, my former English <laughs> teacher, now retired English teacher, I should be so, Nanette Hope Graff. And I can't quit the case until the Net Hope Graf quits the case. And so uh, uh, I, uh, people like that, Mary Dickinson and Tariq, are, are my inspiration also. Uh, thank you. Tariq, thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you for coming out uh, and doing this. And again, I want to thank everybody for turning out. Uh, we will have other events and let you know and pass the word so other people can get involved and try to get some progress here. What we've been able to do is a young lady in Pennsylvania, the same person that 
brought the uh, ATF to work to Vicky, we could just call her up and she fat emailed it to us. And so this is a warrant from the ATF naming her sister in the uh, search of it. And I think best that you didn't, you didn't have that. No, you I have the power. Have okay. if you, do you have a flash drive with you? I'll download it to you. I don't, send it to but you can, you can uh, send it to me. Okay. Yeah, this, you know, no. during that time, um, there was some reference here about uh, that the ATF or the FBI. My understanding was that the ATF and the FBI were in conflict with each other as to who was going to get to raid the headquarters. That's why it didn't get raided. And, and, and just one little caveat here. I don't know if anybody had ever been in Mongo's presence or in his house. It was like going to hell. That man kept that furnace so damn high. I mean, and, and everybody would sweat. I mean, even in the summer, it was 100 degrees out, he still had the furnace turned all the way up. You can't keep dynamite in a, in a location like that. And that further uh, supports our belief that the FBI planted that dynamite. It could have been in there, and they said the dynamite was leaking. Uh, not too glistening. That's that's a volatile situation. Well, you know, Nobody in the right mind would do that. And for them to say they found dynamite particles, we would learn later that there's no such thing as far as they said they found dynamite particles in their clothes. And if you notice when Mondo yeah. was arrested, his hands was in his pocket, all the way down in his pocket. But then they said they found no evidence of traces of dynamite on his hands. So you have to think of a fire laundry detergent or nothing at all, something just made up. Then another guy from the FBI lab was trying to told us there was no such thing as dynamite particles. Like that you were gonna have uh, whatever in a different content, but there's no such thing as particles. So.